In this video, what I want to do is make a few addendums to my video on Dedekind cuts. So this is kind of a part two. I want it to be very short. So there's a few things that I uh, didn't do, and then there's one thing that I did incorrectly that I want to fix. So just to remind you, we in the last video talked about R being the set of all cuts of the irrational numbers. Okay, so here alpha is a cut. Remember a cut is a subset of the rationals that is a non-trivial subset. So it's not empty, it's not all the rationals. It's closed downward. So if there's some rational number, um, so here's the real line. If there's some rational number that's in there, then every smaller rational number is also in the set. Uh, and it doesn't include the right endpoint. So the supremum of alpha is not in alpha itself. So, uh, again, alpha being the set of rationals where x is less than or equal to zero um, is not a cut because it includes the largest element. Um, alpha being the set of negative rational numbers is a cut. Okay, and in fact, this second cut uh, that I talked about has a special name. That's the additive identity. So this is uh, what's going to play the role of zero. And so this is all the rationals uh, that are negative, using the usual ordering of the rationals that we talked about last time. Uh, and this is a very special cut. So again, it's the additive identity. Now, we also can talk a little bit about the ordering of the reals. We didn't talk about that at all. So we, we had a theorem from Dedekind that said that there's a unique ordered field that contains the rationals, and that's the real numbers, okay? This is that unique ordered field. There's a few things that I wanna talk about there. So first is why is it ordered? How do, we, uh, how do we say it's ordered? Well, in order to be ordered, all you have to do is kind of have an idea or a notion of being positive. And so uh, we're gonna say that a cut alpha is positive when uh, the set alpha, the cut alpha, contains uh, the zero, the additive identity, and it's not equal to. So where alpha is not equal to zero. Okay, so if you have a, a set that contains the negative rationals, if you have a cut that contains the negative rationals, then we're going to call such a cut positive. And then we can, uh, after that, put on an order, we're going to say that alpha is less than beta when uh, beta minus alpha is positive. It really, all that this means, um, to say that alpha is less than beta, really this means just that alpha is a subset of beta uh, and it's strictly not equal to. So alpha is a, a strict subset of beta. So that's really all it means for alpha to be less than beta. So... That's how we order the reals. That tells us a little bit there, so that's why it's an ordered field. Well, that's why it's ordered. Next, let's talk about um, the fact that it's a field. So given a cut alpha, so given a cut alpha, we can define the multiplicative inverse in the following way. Remember that multiplication was a little bit tricky. We had to, in fact, let's review multiplication for just a second, because I think that there's a, a little bit more I wanted to say there. So first, let's review how we multiply cuts. So given two cuts, alpha and beta, let's say alpha and beta are positive. And then once we know how to multiply positive numbers, we can modify our definition of multiplication to include all cuts. So given alpha and beta uh, where they're positive, we can define alpha times beta to be the product of all the values x and y, where x is in alpha, y is in beta, but where x is greater than or equal to zero and y is greater than or equal to zero. And then we're going to take that and take the union with all the negative rationals, which remember we're calling a zero star. And so that's how we can define multiplication of two cuts if the two cuts are positive. And then if the two cuts are, if one of them is not positive, uh, what we can do is we can just talk about, um, we can say that alpha times beta is going to be 
uh, minus alpha times minus beta if alpha and beta are negative. So if alpha and beta are both um, strict subsets of uh, zero, um, we can define alpha times beta as the inverse of negative alpha times beta. Okay, so this is going to be if alpha is negative and beta is positive. And then we can do the kind of a similar thing if alpha is positive but beta is negative. Remember putting a minus in front, we're talking about the additive inverse. So we talked about that. Um, that again had a pretty precise definition, but, um, but that is what it is. And so if we kind of put all of this together, this is how we multiply with one more. Uh, we need one more thing here. Um, we just define alpha times zero to be zero for all cuts alpha. Okay, and so that's how we multiply. I don't know if I said this kind of in general. I showed you how it worked for positive, uh, for positive cuts. And then let's talk about how to find alpha inverse. So this is going to be multiplicative inverse. This is what makes it a field. Here I'm assuming, of course, alpha is not the zero. So it turns out that if you want to write alpha inverse, this is going to be kind of the, uh, again, it's just a little bit fiddly. It's what it is. It's going to be uh, zero um, union. So it's going to be the rational number zero union, um, the set of negative rationals, uh, union, the set of all rationals with the following property. So it's going to be the set of all rationals uh, where uh, there exists an epsilon such that um, such that uh, epsilon is greater than x and 1 over epsilon is not in alpha. And so if you take alpha to be, say, the set of rationals where x is strictly less than 2, then... Uh, alpha inverse would be the set of all rationals where x is less than one half. And so you can uh, kind of play around with this a little bit, figure out exactly, um, because multiplication is kind of a convoluted process, because we want it to agree with multiplication of rationals. So it's not that it's convoluted just to make it work. It's convoluted so that we kind of include the rationals. This is an, what's called a field extension of the rationals. We want to have all of the stuff and all the nice properties of the rationals. We want it to stay put when we talk about bigger sets that contain the rationals. And so this is how we have to define multiplication um, in a way that agrees with the rationals. And therefore, this is how we have to define uh, the multiplicative inverse. Okay, and so this is going to end up um, being a well-defined cut whenever alpha is not the zero element. And of course, zero doesn't have a multiplicative inverse. Okay, so again, these are exactly the cuts where um, alpha times alpha inverse is going to give us uh, that value one. Okay, so this is all the rationals that are strictly less than one. Okay, so we now have talked about the fact that the real numbers are ordered. We've talked about the fact that the real numbers are a field. Every non-zero element has a multiplicative inverse. The final thing that we need to talk about is that they're complete. The, the set of real numbers has the least upper, uh, least upper bound property. Having the least upper bound property means that the, the set is complete. So we talked about the rationals being incomplete. Um, and so there's a little bit of cleanup I want to do there. This, this is one mistake that I made last time. We talked about the cut. So I just want to fix, uh, I want to fix this. Let's see if I can do it right today. Um, last time we talked about the cut of rationals where x squared was less than 2 and uh, or I should say or x was negative and this is a perfectly well-defined cut of the rationals this is going to be a cut that corresponds to the real number square root of 2 and I wanted to explain why the supremum of alpha doesn't exist as a rational number Okay, so first we'll talk about what the problem was with this set, why there is no supremum. 
And then after that, we'll talk about how to fix it. So the supremum of alpha is not in Q. Let's say that, let's just suppose, and I might be mixing up um, our terminology here, but let's just suppose that uh, beta was the supremum of this cut alpha, and beta happens to be rational. It turns out that if we consider, think about what this means, by the way. This means that beta is an upper bound for all the values in alpha. So if you have a rational number, like 1.4, when you square 1.4, um, you get something a little bit less than 2. And so 1.4 is in this set. So uh, your upper bound has to be a little bigger than 1.4. Let's say it's 1.5. My iPad loves to scroll by itself, sorry. So let's say you have the upper bound uh, 1.5, which is a rational number. It turns out no matter what rational number you have as your upper bound, you can find a smaller rational number that's still an upper bound for the set. And in that sense, there's no least upper bound. So it doesn't matter how close you are to being an upper bound, you can always find a smaller rational number that's an upper bound. So here's how I want to prove this. Let's suppose that beta is the supremum of alpha. And then I want to consider the number gamma, which is going to be beta minus beta squared minus 2 over beta plus 2. And it turns out, and I'll have you check, that gamma is going to be less than beta. Okay? Remember that beta is an upper bound for the set. So beta squared minus 2 is positive. Okay? So here we have beta minus a positive number. And so uh, beta, it turns out, um, can't be the least upper bound because here's a smaller one. And you can repeat this process as much as you want. So no matter, the point is, no matter what upper bound for alpha you have, you can always find a smaller rational number that's also an upper bound. Okay, so it turns out, it turns out that uh, gamma is less than beta and gamma is an upper bound. For alpha. Sorry about my dog barking in the background. Okay, that's the completeness problem for the rationals. There are certain sets of rationals that just don't have an upper bound, don't have a least upper bound that's rational. Okay, and so we need to leave the set of rationals in order to talk about a complete set or a set that has the least upper bound property. And it turns out R does have the least upper bound property. I don't want to write this out in full detail, but I want to at least give you a feeling of why this works for R, but not Q. So R has the least upper bound property. And this is what makes R pretty special. And so I hinted at this last time, but I want to spell it out a little bit. Let's suppose that we have some subset of the rationals. Uh, I'm going to call it A. So let's suppose that we have some subset of the rationals A, um, where A is non-empty. What we want to do is we want to show that A has a least upper bound. So we want to show A has a least upper bound. Here, I guess we also want A not to... Um, I need to be a little bit careful here. Um, in order to have a least upper bound, it has to have an upper bound. So to say that um, a set has the least upper bound property means that if there's an upper bound, then there's a least upper bound. So we want to just be a little careful here. Like if A is the set of real numbers themselves, there is no upper bound to talk about at all. So therefore, there's no least upper bound. That's different. That is qualitatively different than what happened here. So with the rationals, with the set that we were talking about corresponding to square root of 2, there were upper bounds, but no least upper bound. There's kind of a, uh, something was missing. Here, we can't make any sense of the supremum because there are no upper bounds to begin with. That's, a, again, just a different situation. So we want to show that A has a least upper bound. Let me again add that A is not empty, and A should be bounded above. So um, let's suppose that A is a subset of reals, 
um, that is bounded above. So in other words, let's suppose right off the bat that there must be at least one upper bound. Okay, in that case, we want to show that A has the least upper bound property. Okay, we want to show that A has a, a least upper bound. It turns out that what we can do here is we can think of A as a collection of cuts. We can call them uh, alpha sub i, and then we're going to take i to be in some collection. This collection i can be a countable set, it can be an uncountable set, it can be really as big as you want. It turns out that to talk about the supremum of A, we're going to call that gamma, where gamma is the union of all of that cuts alpha sub i. And it turns out if I take the union of all of the cuts, whatever that is, if I call it gamma, gamma will be the supremum of A. Okay, and so just to put this in, in kind of a more plain context, if I'm talking about, say, um, the set of real numbers that corresponds to the rational numbers, say, 2, 3, and 5, then what would the supremum of A be as a rational number? Well, it would be 5. Okay, but remember that we're really talking about cuts. So I'm going to put stars here. 2 stars is going to be the set of rational numbers that are less than 2. 3 stars, the set of rational numbers that are less than 3. 5 stars, the set of rational numbers that are less than 5. And if I want to talk about the supremum, then what I mean by that is um, the supremum of our set A is just going to be the union of all these cuts. And so kind of the largest of them in that sense, kind of in a set containment sense. And so for us, that's going to be the cut corresponding to 5. And it turns out that that trick works for any subset of the reals that's bounded above. Okay, and so that's how we can talk about uh, the supremum of real numbers. This is a well-defined operation that's going to work for any non-empty set of real numbers that's bounded above. And therefore, the reals are complete. They have a supremum for any subset that's different than what happened for the rationals. Okay, so I think that's everything I wanted to say that I missed in the first video. Hope everyone's enjoying their snow day. We'll see you next week on Monday.